In our last video, we talked about what are intermolecular forces and how do we identify them. Today, we're going to talk about how to differentiate between uh, intermolecular forces and try to explain what they actually are. So hopefully you recall that we said the forces that exist within an atom are intramolecular forces, like this is a water molecule and this is a covalent bond, which is an intramolecular force. But if we look at the, uh, the force that keeps one water molecule attached to another water molecule, that would be called an intermolecular force. So you break an intermolecular force when you melt, boil, or freeze something. So first, which forces are stronger? So let's look at different categories. Remember we talked about intermolecular forces versus ionic versus covalent. Remember, ionic are the strongest, so that would be number one, then covalent, and then after that we have intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces like dipole-dipole are about only 1% as strong as covalent. So that explains why if an intermolecular force is a physical change. It, doesn't, it takes energy but not a tremendous amount. A covalent, when you break a covalent intramolecular force, that would be like breaking that bond right there, that's a chemical reaction that requires a lot more in in energy. Remember, we're going to use a, the abbreviation IOMF to stand for intermolecular force. And what we're going to do today is talk about the difference between the intermolecular forces. Remember, the intermolecular forces are London dispersion force, dipole-dipole, and hydrogen bonding. So we're going to try and differentiate between those three forces that are all of themselves weaker than covalent. So when we're looking at this, the strength of intermolecular forces, we're actually going to go in reverse. The strongest type of intermolecular force is hydrogen bonding. The second strongest is dipole-dipole. And the third strongest is London dispersion force. So what we're going to try and do is talk about each one and say why well, it's a little bit different. So first of all, let's start. Let's go backwards with the drawing that I have here and talk about the strongest type of intermolecular force, which is hydrogen bonding. A couple things about that. One, this is a there's hydrogen bonds or the or the water molecule has a permanent dipole. So anything that has a hydrogen bond, the the particle has what we call a permanent dipole. And you see this on the drawing here, we've represented the permanent dipole with a partial negative, and there also there's a partial positive. So that is always going to be there, so that's a permanent dipole. The second thing is the molecule itself is polar. So you only have a permanent dipole on a, perm on a polar molecule. Now the other thing that differenti differentiates hydrogen bonding from any of the other type is this permanent dipole in this polar molecule is extremely strong. I mean, there's a big difference in those electronegativities. So hydrogen bonding only exists between hydrogen and one of three elements, oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. Those are the three most electronegative elements. So what happens, there's a huge difference in the electronegativity, for example, in the oxygen and the hydrogen, or the fluorine and the hydrogen, or the nitrogen and hydrogen. And that big difference means that electronegative element pulls those electrons much more. And so even though we say partial, that partial is stronger than other partials. So that's a very strong partial negative, and that's a very strong partial positive. So what that means is when that water molecule forms that intermolecular force, which is right here that's represented with the dots or the dashes, this hydrogen bond is pretty strong. And it takes a lot of energy to break. And that's why we see hydrogen bonding when water freezes or when water goes and it forms a liquid. That's a hydrogen bond. So hydrogen bonds, the strong, when you compare uh, the intermolecular forces, is the strongest type of intermolecular force. The second strongest type of intermolecular force is a dipole-dipole. Now dipole-dipole, we abbreviate sometimes as dip-dip, just because it's more fun to say dip-dip than is dipole-dipole. Um, well, for the dipole-dipole uh, di or dip-dip, two things are similar. One is a molecule is polar. If you look at, look at the HCl we have here, it is definitely a polar molecule. The other thing is there's also what we call a permanent dipole. That, it, that chlorine is always going to be partially negative, and the hydrogen is always going to be partially positive. And so the dipole-dipole interaction, once again, is represented by this dashed line. Now, this bond is just a little bit weaker. And the reason this is weaker is that difference in electronegativity is not as great, so that partial negative, that partial positive is not as strong. Now, when we compare dipole-dipole to covalent, we usually say they're about 1% as strong, and hydrogen bonding is only still 4% as strong. So you see 
there are forces that exist that are important, important forces in our world, but they're still much weaker than covalent forces. And the final type of force is probably one of the most difficult ones to understand is the Lenin dispersion force. Now what's difficult about this is we see we've got two, it could be a, a molecule or it could be an atom because in an atom there's not a permanent negative or positive side. Now if you see in this drawing it looks like well there's a, a negative, a positive drawn there and a negative drawn there. Well, two things we want to say about this, Lenin dispersion forces exist in nonpolar molecules. So it's a nonpolar, either an atom or a molecule. So what happens, there's not a, what we call a permanent dipole that exists there. So this means that this molecule doesn't have a negative or a positive spot always there. So what we call, there is actually a negative or positive portion that can form we call this an induced dipole. Now this induced dipole is not as strong typically as the permanent dipole that we see in dip-dip or hydrogen bonding. But it does exist and it's important. So London and dispersion forces do hold nonpolar molecules together when they're in the solid state or in the liquid state, but it's a weaker force than we see in those other two. So that's pretty much it about the differences between those different types of intermolecular forces. Now once again, when are these broken? Well, let's start, think about this. When do you break? When do you break an intermolecular force? So you think about a force as pulling things apart. You're trying to break either that hydrogen bond, or that dipole-dipole interaction, or that London dispersion force. You put in energy. The energy be represented by if you're trying to boil something and go from a liquid to a vapor. If you're trying to melt something, go from a solid to a liquid. That would be, so the energy you're putting in is actually going to be pulling those molecules apart. And so the hydrogen bond or the dipole-dipole London dispersion force would be represented as what's between those and you're putting energy in and you're trying to pull those apart. So let's talk, this is an important chart because on this chart we actually have all three types of intermolecular forces. We have hydrogen bonding, London dispersion force, and dipole-dipole. So hopefully you're able to identify, this is one thing I would like you to be able to do is look at a particle and tell me which type of force it has. For example, we've mentioned water before. Hopefully everybody knows that water has what type of intermolecular molecular force? Hydrogen bonding. Hopefully you got that one. So when one water molecule is attracted to another water molecule, it would be this hydrogen and this oxygen like that, that would be a hydrogen bond. Now that's an extremely type, strong type of intermolecular molecular force. Now how do we know that? Well there's a couple ways we can look at the strength of intermolecular force. One of those is boiling point. So we have, a, so this chart is relating boiling point and we're going to talk about how, what that has to do with intermolecular force. The higher the boiling point on a particle, the stronger its intermolecular force. So if you look at all the particles that are on this drawing, the one with the strongest type of intermolecular force would be water. Now why is that? Well water has the strongest type of intermolecular force that we know about, that's a hydrogen bond. Now you look at the second strongest and that would be hydrogen fluoride. Now what type of bonding is there? Hydrogen bonding once again and then here we have ammonia. So here we have three very strong types of intermolecular forces but every single one of those is a hydrogen bond. Now look at the weakest type of intermolecular force on this chart and that would be the thing with the lowest boiling point and that would be our friend methane. Remember when we use methane if you've ever flagellated or uh, methane's a flammable gas. Methane CH4 is usually a gas. Well it can be a liquid. How do, what is a point at which it goes from a from a I'm sorry from a liquid to a gas? It's a very very uh, low temperature so it's got a very very weak bond. Well, uh, if you remember the way methane is drawn it is a nonpolar molecule. The type of intermolecular force you have in nonpolar molecules, only one possible is London dispersion. So that is London dispersion is the weakest type, and so we have the lowest boiling point. You notice which other particles here have London dispersion? We'd see that that would be all the particles that are drawn right here: the SH4, GEH4, and SIH4. All those have London dispersion forces because all those are nonpolar molecules. Now if you look at everything that's left on this chart, all the other particles have them, the intermolecular force that is in between those. That's called dipole-dipole. So all the other particles on here are polar 
but they do not have hydrogen attached to one of those three electronegative elements. Now, one thing you may be wondering is why are some of these forces stronger than others? For example, among the London dispersion force, we see pretty big variation in the boiling point. The reason has to do with the number of electrons. You see it, I drew a little E there. Methane has only a few electrons, and then as you go to silicon, to germanium, to, to 10, there's more and more electrons. The more electrons, the more polarizable and the stronger the intermolecular force. So let's look at one last chart, and that would be this chart right here. So freezing point is also an indication of strength of intermolecular force. So, if you see, we have helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. Now, where do you find all these things on the periodic table? Well, they are all our friends' halogens. Now, if you look there, uh, on the periodic table, you have helium, and helium only has, has a molar mass of two, but it only has two protons, which means it only has two electrons. So, helium has a pretty, pretty, uh, it's pretty, pretty low boiling point. But the highest boiling point is going to be the, be the noble gas with the most electrons. So we see xenon, which has 54 electrons, which is quite a few. So it's got the highest boiling point of all these uh, noble gases because of the number of electrons. So we see every single one of these are elements, and so they cannot be polar. So everything on here, since it's simply an element, would be considered nonpolar. And remember, if anything is nonpolar, the only type of intermolecular force they can have is a London dispersion force. Now, what would make one dis London dispersion force stronger and another weaker is the number of electrons. So, what we see here, helium has the fewest number of electrons, so it has the weakest London dispersion force, and thus it has the lowest boiling point. On the other hand, of the ones we're comparing here, xenon has the most electrons, Thus, it has the highest London, uh, the strongest London dispersion force, and thus it has a highest boiling. I'm sorry, I wrote boiling here. This should be freezing. It has a highest freezing point, which means it takes more energy to break apart xenon than it does helium. And that's going to conclude us. So, what we're going to conclude with, I have here my friend the mole, and uh, I don't know if you guys have met the mole, but uh, I thought I'd tell him. Uh, our finishing words, and the first one is, I love chemistry. Next one, I love chemistry. Next last one is, I love chemistry. <laughs>